Open your Bibles to James, the fourth chapter, 13 through 17. I want to do one more study out of that passage before I leave it. Um, you've probably heard this phrase, best laid plans. I know I heard it all my life. And uh, I... In, at least in my remembrance of this phrase, uh, hearing it as a young person growing up, it always seemed to have the fact that the best laid plans never worked out. Is that is that pretty much the way? It, the best laid plans, plans of mice and men go aft astray. You say it again? Go aft astray. The best laid plans of mice and men go aft astray. Oh. Yeah, that sounds about right. Scottish. Scottish. Best laid plans of mice and men that can't believe. So that's the way I learned it back in college days. Well, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it was true. <laughs> 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 God's land worms. There you go. My way you opened a can of worms. I, I, I did. <laughs> Mike says I just opened a can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all right. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, uh, anyhow. Uh, there we have it. So he talks about that. He actually talks about that in verse 13 and 14. He doesn't use that phrase, but he talks about it. And so God, for me, uh, God has a better laid plan. And so, uh, and he talks about that in this passage. So in verses 13 and 14, I, I wrote on my paper, best laid plans, uh, human, human will or human thinking. He says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, engage in business, and make a profit. He says, well, there's two problems with that. There's two problems with that philosophy. He says, first, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You have, I mean, who knows what tomorrow holds? And secondly, you are not a vapor. Uh, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And he's talking about how our life is. Then in verses, verse of 15, he, said, he gives us a better plan, a better laid plan. In verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Then he 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 makes a statement in verse 16 and makes a conclusion about it in verse 17. He says, but as it is, you boast in your ignorance, verse 13 and 14, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> By the right thing to do means you know what God's will is. See, he's identified that in what you ought to say if it's the Lord's will. So the right thing to do in conclusion, see, he compares the right thing and the wrong thing uh, is whether or not the Lord's will is involved in it is the important part. So the better, the better laid plan <clears throat> for the believer <clears throat> is <clears throat> follow God's will. Okay, follow God's will. So I want to come back and do that. And, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, bring this <clears throat> back to our forefront uh, of our personal lives to make sure that we uh, are in a better, that we understand that we're in a better plan for our life. And it, it, that better plan is always going along with the will of God, not against it, but going with it, not against it. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about four things about a better laid plan uh, based on the directive will of God for your life. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get back into this study. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in, it could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. 
These need to be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's important to you. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, that makes, that's what makes you a believer. The moment you believed, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He is there forever, John 14, 16. And uh, he's there so that you can be a spiritual person, walk in the spirit, not the flesh. So that you can enjoy your journey in this life. And so, our Father, we thank you today for all that grace has provided us to be here under the banner of freedom today. Uh, what a privilege we have in America, Father, to assemble without censorship and teach without censorship. And that's an enormous privilege we have. And sometimes it is so commonplace, we take it for granted and we should take it for grace. And so I, I thank you for it. I pray tonight the Holy Spirit would minister through the word of God truth to us that would affect our daily life and help us enjoy our journey. How important is the will of God to our life? It's, it's essential every day. Every day, every day. We live each day, one day at a time. Nobody gets to leave, nobody gets to live two days at a time, nor a whole week at a time. We live one day at a time. And the writer, James, is trying to bring us back to that. We get so troubled about tomorrow's when we should be just dealing with today's. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> James, in this passage of verse chapter 4, 13 through 17, reminds a spiritually advancing believer, I hope that's you, I can't imagine you coming to Bible study on Tuesdays and Wednesday and not be uh, a, uh, a concept you've bought into. But James reminds the spiritually advancing believer that God's will is the better laid plan for the Christian way of life. One of the first things you should have when you're struggling with some issue in your life is you ought to ask yourself, what's the Bible say? And you ought to go... You ought to search like crazy until you find the answer to that. What's the Bible say? What, what is, because what you're after is what is God's will. Is it God's will for you to do this or that? See what he said? This is really important. Look at the this and that. Because that's our life. This or that. If the Lord's will, we will live and we do this or that. This or that. It's choices. And when you come to choices, we all come to choices. Our whole life is loaded up with choices and decisions we have to make every day of our life. And uh, you study the Bible to learn what the will of God is so that when it comes time to do this or that, you have to make a choice between this and that. You can make it according to the will of God. If it is God's will, we will do this or we will do that. And hopefully we can come to some understanding about that today. The argument against the, the argument that the writers making against the best laid plans is the two obvious common sense ideas that he stated in verse 14. I'm going to call it the unknown and the vapor. The unknown and the vapor. For the unknown, here's what he says. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You do not know. You say, well, I do. I know exactly what I'm going to do tomorrow. Okay, so suppose you have a serious accident on the way. Well, that screwed that whole program up, didn't it? Um, I mean, there's so many other issues isn't it what tomorrow holds listen best you can do is what you got on your plate today listen there's enough to to deal with on your plate today than to worry about tomorrow and so listen he says the first thing is that look face reality i was talking to i was 
thinking of my young college kid here tonight. I was talking to a young person that graduated two years ago with a really tough degree. I mean, and was convinced from junior high school that this was the career path that person wanted to take. And she laid out all of it, all of her plans to get there. And then she went to work one year in the industry and hated it. And has now gone back to school to try to figure out what to do with all of her credit hours to something. I suggested she should take a sabbatical from education and go just get a job. Don't go for another education. Go get a job. Why don't you just take a year off? You're, it sounds like you're burned out anyhow. Why don't you just go get a job in a field you think you might like to do? You're, you'd probably be overqualified, but maybe somebody will hire you. We're in a big hiring boom right now. That's what I'd do. When I grew up as a, as a young pe person, if I said, if, if my grandfather, and he often did this, because I, I told him I'm not going to be a farmer. I'm not going to be a farmer. So he would say to me, well, what would you like to be? If I suggested something, he would find me a job there. It may be sweeping the floor. And my mother was just like him. And I did so many crazy jobs during my high school summers, you cannot believe what they got me doing. If I said, well, I, like one time I said, well, I might, I, I've been thinking about uh, maybe being an undertaker. <laughs> and so they had a, they, who knew they had a friend that was in the business. One summer, I spent the whole summer, and he put me through the ringer. I mean, I was downstairs, and, my, and formaldehyde would get it. Uh, the smell would in my hair. I washed my hair three or four times, and I had a date that night. And without exception, the person would go, what is that smell? <laughs> I could not get it out of my hair. And at 15, you don't want to choose that field. You can't even get a girl. So... So, I mean, how important do you think it might be to listen to the Lord about it? I mean, you think he's concerned about it? He was with Joseph. And whatever you're pursuing, maybe, maybe, maybe you ought to go look at the career base of what you're actually going to have to do. When I, when I was going through m my advanced schooling, uh, my per we all had in, in ministers ministerial we all had to serve somewhere in the church it was required of us hopefully we could get paid but maybe not um, I had a wife and two kids I had to get paid <laughs> so we looked at all kinds of things but they made you go into the field before you would graduate you had to go serve you had to serve um, forget what they call that, but they had to go serve in, the field, in your field somewhere. Uh, kind of like what they do in teaching, where student teaching, we had to do it within our last two years before we could graduate. We had to go actually out in the field and serve, not for a week or a weekend, but I mean like a year. Uh, 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 internship. Internship. Uh, uh, the least you could get was like a quarter, but most of them. And so um, I wasn't quite sure, but I had to have a job. <laughs> I, somebody had to pay me, get me a pastoring or something. So I, I pastored a small rural church, and it was wonderful for me. It was terrible for them, but <laughs> they should never hire anybody green under the ears, and I was green all the way to my belly button. So, I mean, I was way beyond my ears being green. So my point is this, my point in not running a rabbit trail here is, look, here's the one thing that for sure you don't know, you don't know about tomorrow. 
it's okay to plan about it, but don't lose your expectation when it doesn't, when tomorrow turns into a mess, right? Because you don't know what tomorrow. Look, we don't even know. Here, here it's morning. We don't even know what the afternoon is going to be like, let alone tomorrow. Uh, so he says, the unknown, tomorrow, tomorrow is always unknown. The best laid plans, tomorrow is always unknown. Doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, think about it. It just means you have to have a better plan than that because everything tomorrow could be unknown. The other thing that he says that can disrupt this idea of best laid plans is that your life's a vapor. Uh, that vapor, you know, is just a breath that you can actually see in a cold day. We talked about that. Uh, you're just a vapor. Your breath, you know, you can see it when somebody smokes, they blow it out. Or you can see it on a cold day when you can do it actually without a cigarette. When little kids, we used to do that. Everybody I knew smoked. Uh, and today, ha hasn't life changed? I mean, people really got serious about tobacco, didn't they? And, uh, and smoke that's inside. And uh, you don't have that much in families anymore. I don't have anybody in my family smoke. I mean, all the way down to grandkids, they just like, I'm not going to smoke. And everybody I knew, I grew up with, everybody smoked. In fact, I got in trouble doing it when I was a small kid, right? Uh, if, you, if you want to smoke, get your own, is what my people told me. <laughs> you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I, and I often uh, say to you that that's the hyphen on the tombstone. And uh, this, fourth, uh, this uh, Memorial Day it really touched my soul that I should get out and... Uh, check the graves of the people that I knew within my family structure that I knew where the graves were uh, to make sure that they were taken care of. I've been seeing on the news where people don't take care of graveyards and that. I think that's just pitiful. I think that's just pitiful. And what's happened to Memorial Days when we used to go out and clean them? I, I did every Memorial Day. I went with my grandfather to the, the local cemetery, and we cleaned the whole cemetery. A decoration day, we call it, yeah. Is that the same one, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rural churches still do it. I know the church, little church I had, we had a cemetery, and and we did that. But but it, it was, you know, it was just a wonderful thing. And I, walking through the cemetery, I, I saw, I was up here at um, Jefferson Memorial, where most of our people are, and Walking through there, uh, I was looking for vets. If I could find vets that didn't have flags, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna put vet, I'm gonna put flags on these. And uh, but a lot of people, a lot of people don't have their don't have the vet thing on it. And if you're a veteran, if you're gonna have a tombstone, please put it put please put you served in the military on it. That that uh, that would have been. And I saw some of them. And then, and we've done that as family, but. I, th I saw all kinds of people that I knew, you know, their tombstones that um, it was just interesting. It was just interesting. And this little hyphen, <laughs> they all had the hyphen, birth date, dash, death date. Yeah, all, all of them had it. And, and, and I, I always think about the hyphen connects two related things, birth and death. The hyphen is the story of one's entire life, <laughs> a hyphen. Of course, you couldn't put it all on there, but that's what he's saying. That's your vapor. That's your vapor. Do you know the Hebrew nishamahayim? Nishamahayim is found in Genesis 2-7, and it's, it's, the, it's this vapor. Nishamahayim is this vapor. Nishama. <laughs> Nishama. Haim. That I am on the end of that Hebrew word makes a plural. And that means the, the breath of lives 
This is the word for breath. This is the word breath or vapor. And hyim, that plural, makes it lives. The breath of lives. That's uh, God breathed into man the breath of life. In the English, that's what it says. And God breathed, at, at, talking about Adam in Genesis 2, 7. And he breathed into him the breath of life. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says he breathed into him the breath of lives. You, you know where those lives came from? Came from God. God breathed into his nostrils, the Bible says, the breath of lives. Because in Genesis 2, 17, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat, dying you will die. There's a double death there. Just all kind of interesting, but this word vapor in Hebrew is called nishama haim, and it's the breath, and that's what vapor is. It's the vapor is the breath. That's the idea, <coughs> or the spirit. They, the the word breath could be the word breath in the English is is it's called wind, spirit, breath, vapor. The word vapor, however, in this one is the little word atmos. You remember that? Where atmosphere comes from, the word, the, the word vapor. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, therefore, uh, what's my point? Therefore, the point would be uh, what is important while living, uh, therefore, the choices, what it cho choose what is important while living between the unknown part of life and the vapor that vanishes. In other words, Here's what James is saying is there's a whole life to be lived between birth and death. There's a whole life. And let me tell you how that whole life, it'll go well with you. Serve the better laid plan, which is the will of God. We're supposed to live it daily, and therefore the will of God should be an important issue in your life every day. Right? If it is God's will, we will do this or that. He says, not, not about tomorrow, about today, right? And where does the will of God come from? How do you learn what is the will of God? See, I meet a lot of Christians that think, you don't think God cares about every, every nitpicking thing I have to decide today. My, listen to me. My answer is absolutely you see, I found it to be true in my life. And I'll give you an example. Does he care about what you eat? He says, this, this, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah, he does. And who, and who are we talking to? God. You know, I've grown, as I've gotten older, I've grown to thank God every day for everything I have. I even get to the sense where I, I go through my whole, see, I believe my body is the temple of God. Not Greek gods, but <laughs> the, all, the almighty God. All right? So, I, in my prayer life, I tell him what I believe about that. I believe my body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And so I pray every day about my entire body, my brain, you know, all the things. I visit, you know, I visited hospital. I don't do it much anymore, but I visit the hospital all my, my life. I visited as a pastor, visit the hospital. And I pray about all the things people suffer from. And I pray, I pray for Deborah Smith. I say, Father, wait, come on now. Her body is the temple of God. Now, I know that she's in a test system with you. But I plead for her body. I plead for her body, the temple of God. 
to be cleansed from this disease. I, I pray that. And if it's being used uh, for whatever it's being used for, look, I'm okay with that. I'm just telling you how I feel about it. <laughs> because according to my Bible, what you've taught me, her body is the temple of God. Now, I know it belongs to you, and it doesn't belong to her, and it doesn't belong to me, but I'm just saying I'm pleading her case on behalf of the fact that her body is the temple of God. And on my end of it, I can only speak for my end of it because I don't know her end of it. But for my end of it, I plead, I plead that case for her. And uh, look, as long as Nisha Mahayim is in your body, God has a plan for your life. That's what he's talking about. If it's, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this or that. And that's, that's what I pray for her soul. I pray for her body one prayer, and I pray for her soul another pray, prayer. And I do that for everybody that is on my prayer line. I make distinctions how I pray for people when I hear them. Here's what I'm going through. Pray for me. I'm going to the hospital. I'm having such and such a, a test done. I go, okay. You know, listen. We're, we're uniquely made. Now, listen to me. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we're, we're, we're uniquely made. Listen to how we're uniquely made. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. So, anything that touches your life affects you, body, soul, and spirit, and affects you all three at all time. Is that not one? If you have one thing going on, you know, if your big toe hurts, the whole body, you know, uh, know for certain Point number one says, know for certain that one of those important things of life in that hyphen is to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will never know what the will of God is until you become a believer in God himself. And you can't do that except through his son Christ. And you can't do that unless you understand he came into this world to die on a cross for your sins and mine, was buried and raised on the third day. That's called the gospel. When you believe it, you get saved. And if you believe anything else, you won't get saved. It's just that simple. It's not difficult. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us that's the gospel. He died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day. Calls that the gospel. Romans 1, 16. I love this one because it says the gospel, the gospel, which I just explained, is the power of God to save everyone who believes. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace are you saved and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. At least any man boast. I mean, all you can do about salvation is, is boast about God. You can't boast about yourself. You've got nothing to boast about. He did all the work. His son did all the work for you to be saved by grace. It's a gift. You're not saved because you, listen, you're not saved by works and you don't stay saved by works. It's a gift. If it's works, it's wages. If it's grace, it's a gift. It's a gift. You know, one of the passages I've grown to really like is John 5, 24. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, you'll know this. Truly, truly, I say, I like all those truly, truly ones. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears my words, he who hears my words, now listen to this, and believes in, in him who sent me does not come into judgment but is passed from death, thanatos, with a definite article, that spiritual death, thanatos is, is passed and into life, passed out of death and into life, passed out of death into life. That's a good truly, truly, isn't it? Truly, truly, I say unto you. See, it all begins with he who hears the gospel and believes 
And when he believes, he's passed out of spiritual death in time and eternity. That one act of faith moves you from time to eternity. You're passed out of death in time for eternity, and you are passed into, out of judgment and into everlasting life in time and eternity. That's a pretty powerful idea. You know what? how you got that? Grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift. What a wonderful idea. But you see, without Christ as your Savior, your life will just be a hyphen without any story with it about God. And listen, your eternity will be a mess. Your eternity will be a mess. Because listen, if you don't pass out of judgment in time, you will pass into it in eternity. I'm going to read that again now. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. It does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death, is passed out of death, judgment, into life, no judgment, no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. Not now. No more condemnation. What a wonderful... Listen, all that by grace. You didn't earn it. It's a gift. Happy Christmas. Or Merry Christmas. I don't guess it's a happy one. Isn't it interesting? They don't say Happy Christmas. They say Happy New Year's. I say, I think it's because we're in debt by the time Christmas has comes. We're probably in debt. There's nothing happy about that. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. That's not good, is it? Uh, Psalms 102.3. This is a really interesting passage. Passage uh, for people who are suffering. Psalms 102.3. It's all about, it's a passage dealing with suffering. It says, my days are, my days vanish like smoke. It goes on and talks about a lot about the, your, my, my days are like a, uh, my days vanish like a smoke-filled room. I don't know if you like smoke, but can you imagine every day, the day comes and goes, and you've been in a smoke-filled room, sick. Ecclesiastes, of course, 12th chapter, verse 7 says, all your fame and fortune you, you accumulate from the world without Christ becomes, even with Christ, becomes like dust of the earth, like your body. Just think about it. all your fame and all your fame and all your fortune that you've accumulated on earth. You can't take it with you, can you? Naked you came, naked you leave as far as stuff. Now, how important God is. If you've if you've got God and you've laid up treasures in heaven, you say, who else can lay up? Nobody. There's nobody in the whole wide world that can lay up treasures in heaven except Jesus Christ. Believers in Jesus Christ. Believers in Jesus Christ on the earth with their feet right here in Sweet Home, Alabama can lay up for themselves treasures in heaven. Nobody, nobody in this whole wide world can do that with fame and fortune. Nobody can do that. And listen, the little, the little widow, the poor little widow who goes and puts her two cents in there, you, can you imagine what kind of treasures, when she dies and goes to heaven, what kind of treasures that two little pennies given into the, it, it, for God is going to mount for her in heaven? She laid up treasures. She put two in the, in the offering and laid up treasures in heaven, two pennies. I mean, she, she bought a, 
is the price of a dove or maybe a, maybe a sparrow, two cents. A sparrow. I don't think you'd get a dove for two cents. She, she got a sparrow. That's, listen, she gave her meal, which is two cents to buy a sparrow. Yeah, it's two cents to get a sparrow. Tony did a sermon on that. I remember that. She gave up her, her lunch money to the Lord, and that's all she had. She laid treasures in heaven. How do you know that? God, God gave her, her fame and fortune was right there in that passage. <laughs> he put her in the word of God. Here I am talking about her. Say, it's not how much you got. It's where your heart is. And your treasure is where your heart is, isn't it? It always is. It always is. Your heart ought to be with God. Now, the Greek word for life is zoe. Broadhead family have a zoe in it. What a wonderful name. Very few people I've met with the name zoe. Most people go Sophia. They go for the word for wisdom. I really do like zoe, though. The Greek word for zoe the Greek word for life is zoe. And there's two words in the, in the Greek language for life that are commonly used. There's zoe, where we get zoology from, and there's bios, that we get biology from. And it is interesting that when we use the word zoe, that we're, we're dealing with a higher form of life. It is used in reference to the Christian way of life in time and eternity. Zoe. It's a, just an interesting word study in the Greek language, zoe. It's used for the Christian way of life in time and eternity. John 14, 6. We quote this a great deal. Do you know the background of that? Let me tell you the background of John 14, 6, because I know you, you study it. I'm not going to get my lesson done tonight. I, I already <laughs> sense that. Uh, I'm just trotting down the street here. So... Let me tell you, John 14, 6. Let me give you the background. You'll know the background. Listen to this. Well, let me think how it starts. Uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Remember that? John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Uh, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not true, I would, I, would, I would tell you so. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and you will be with me, right? That's John 14. Now, what's in, interesting with John 14, that's the upper room discourse. On it, he's on his way to the cross. When that, day, when that night's over, and the next day, he's going to be on the cross. Right? So he's been telling his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be, I'm going to be charged with a crime. They're, they're going to crucify me. On the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. He's been telling that son. So it's to be for sure into the second year of his ministry, he started preparing him. So now he, he, he's right on, he's into crunch time with him. And so they all, they all are, when you get to verse two and three, they're very curious about what's going on. <laughs> Thomas says, Thomas says, where are you going? I love Thomas because he was, he was a guy who always asked the questions, and he always had he always had some kind of an opinion about it. Well, I like Thomas. I like Thomas. I mean, you know, he says everybody else says, "Well, we've seen Jesus; he's raised from the dead." He said, "Well, that may be good for you, but I got to see it. <laughs> I, I got to touch, feel, and see, man. I just one of those people." This is Thomas, and it's kind of a character, and we get to see his characteristics a, a great deal in the Bible, and so we're not shocked when it comes along, and the disciples say, we've seen Christ, and we've been with him, and he went, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been, I've, I've fished with you guys before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I caught that big, I caught a fish, it was so big, oh, he got away, though, I would like to tell you about it. Um, and so, but they, they go, I, 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 where are you going, where are you going? I mean, should I pack? Are we, are we leaving? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he says to Thomas, he says to Thomas, 
Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father. You know where he was going? He's going to the Father. By way of the cross, burial, and resurrection, he's going to the Father. No one can come to the Father except through me. You know, I, I love John 14, 1. I, I see the compassion of Christ in, in just a most unique way. He's been telling these guys. I mean, he's laid out exactly what's going to happen. He's laid it out. He's gone 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, like in Matthew 16, 17, 20, um, 26, 27. I mean, it's all over the book of Matthew. Matthew, 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 Matthew tracked it. Now we're down to we're down to crunch time. And they don't get it. They just don't get it. And and listen, it'd be hard to get though. I mean, I, I it would be. I mean, it would be hard to perceive that there the nation who's been looking for the Messiah would actually murder him. But that is politics. That's not, re that's not really religion as much as it is politics. It is politics. But he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. I mean, it's hard for your hearts not to, man, like, listen, and he said it because they don't know where he's going. Imagine what their hearts would have felt if they knew where he was actually going. That before this day's over, this whole thing is going to kick into high gear, and tomorrow I'm going to be on a cross. He knows that. They don't. And they're upset because they don't know where he's going. He hasn't laid out his plans to them. And they're, they, you know, Peter's thinking, I got to go home and tell my wife we're going to take another trip. They've all got ideas about tomorrow and not about today, but he doesn't. I mean, I see his heart, but not your hearts be troubled. And then he starts to prepare them for that day in their life when the reality is going to hit them. And uh, it's going to be, a really sad day, and it's going to be a sad day for three days. Now, it's going to be, there's going to be mourning for three days. And then there'll be joy in the morning. There'll be joy in the morning. And for some, it'll take even longer than that, won't it? Because the joy in the morning, they didn't believe, and they had to see it with their own eyes, Thomas. I just find that kind of stuff interesting. Um, John 10, 10. Here, here is Zoe in life, in time. Here's Zoe in time. I came that you might have life, Zoe, and have it abundantly. Christ came to give you Zoe life now. You get this now. And you know what you get with Zoe life? Now, abundance. This word, peros, it's P-E-R. I wrote this thing down. P-E-R-I-S. S-O-S, I believe. Let me look again. I wrote it down. Yeah, P-E-R-I-S-S-O-S. Parisos. Parisos is a word that's used here abundantly. Used as an adverb, but it's used abundantly. It means I think abundantly you understand <laughs> but it means always more than enough. It means always more than enough. 
always more than enough. See, here's what people go, though. Well, I have enough to get me through the end of the week. I have enough to get me through the end of the month. Christ brought you into Zoe life through salvation, brought you into Zoe life salvation so that you would always have enough every day for all of your life and eternity. <laughs> Is that not a deal? For some of us, it's called parenting. I mean, a kid thinks that way, but parents do. Always more than enough. Always more than enough. That's this word. And it's, a, it's called Zoe life. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. For eternity, he mentions it to the, to the girls, Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus. Remember that in John? Look over at John a moment. Just fly over to John. John 11. John 11. John 11. Um, 25, 26. They're all upset with Lazarus' death. And they're upset with him because he didn't come. Right? If you had to come, when we told you to come, when he was really critically ill, we could have resolved this. But, Apparently, apparently, somebody else meant more to you than Lazarus means to us. No, oh, I don't know. I've just heard that kind of people talk that way. Have you ever heard anybody talk about that? Well, you must have cared more I'm about it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, then you understand this. There you go. Yep, that's a, work, that's a, that's a gal that knows how to work you, doesn't it? Right there. Jesus says to her, Martha, says to Martha, I am the resurrection. Martha, Martha had said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. But, yeah, but I was hoping through any of this, yes, I know there's a big resurrection day coming down in the future somewhere in biblical history. But that doesn't. I was hoping that we could get this done before we had to die, see? And Jesus said, well, here's what you missed, Martha, in all of your great theology. Here's what you missed. You missed what's called near theology. I am the resurrection and the life, Zoe. I am it. You know what that I am is? That's, that's I me. It, as an absolute status quo verb of existence in the Greek language, I mean. <laughs> you know what that is? That's in the Old Testament when God said, I am that I am. When Jesus said it, they picked up stones to kill him. But this is what that means. The Greeks had a word for that. I am. He said, I am the absolute status quo of the resurrection and life. And he used the word Zoe. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful people? That's why I, I would rather do a hundred funerals than one wedding. Now I know. But this is the real deal here. Doesn't mean the others aren't. I just, with my personality, I do better with people who are grieving, apparently. 
I, I probably could. I could, but the one makes me grieve in their living. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall leave, live, even if he dies. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Is that a promise? Yes. You, now listen, you know what? When you die, you're going to go from life to life. And death is just a vapor. It's your last breath. Your last breath on earth puts you right into the life that you already have. The, you have Zoe. You have Zoe here. You have Zoe there. If you don't have Zoe here, you don't have Zoe there. I am the resurrection of life, he said. And, and listen to what he says here. This will knock you out of the ballpark right here. And he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? How about that? I sat with Aunt Bice. I tell you the story all the time, but I sat with Aunt Bice as a young rookie pastor. I mean really rookie. Reading the Bible to her on her deathbed. Now, I didn't know it was a deathbed at the time I went in. It was called a sick bed that became a dead bed. Deathbed. As reading her passage, and we were talking, talking about the passage, and she, she I didn't have to, when you went to Ann Bice's house, you didn't have to worry about, you didn't have to go with that, well, what passage will I go? She had so many passages she liked, I could have never got to any of that I liked. Now, when you went to her house, they said, what do you want me to read to you, Aunt Bice? And she'd tell you, buddy. She'd tell you in a heartbeat. And she had some of the, the greatest lines. I wish I could have, I wish I would have wrote them all down. I wasn't smart enough then to write things down. But she had some of the greatest of those things. Tobacco is an Indian weed, and from the devil it does proceed. It will steal your money, burn your clothes, and make a chimney out of your nose. <laughs> and she had... She had thousands of them. I mean, thousands of them, and and uh, she was just a uh, she was just a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, let me let me deal one more point, and we'll close it down for the night. You know, you're such a wonderful group of people. I don't tell you enough how much I really do love your interest in the Word of God. Um, you have you have gone beyond the call of duty to spoil me as a teacher, and I only really grow to grow uh, to appreciate you when I <laughs> go to other places to teach, and uh, they don't have frame of reference as you people do. You 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 are just magnificent students of the Word of God, and I probably don't brag on you enough to your faces. I brag on you a lot behind your back, though. I don't, that's the way I talk about you. Yeah. I talk up. I don't talk down. But, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. 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 It's hard to explain. We had a history teacher in school. Yeah. None of the kids got any any grades out. Yeah. Way too poor. Yeah. He would take his history book and he would walk inside the class. Yeah. And he would keep. He would slam the book down. Yeah. He kept you remember it was called mesmerized. Yeah. You know you couldn't learn that. Yeah. So the way you're teaching it is so great. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And we need it. Yes, well, thank we, you. I want to, I'm speaking for everybody. We need it. Yeah. And we appreciate it. And uh, I'll pay you right after the class. <laughs> I'll pay you. It's not about money. Uh, look, let me get my one point down. We'll be through. Because this connects me to Joseph from the, our study of Joseph. Joseph is one example of the, of the doctrinal principle that God's plan and will triumphs man's plan and will. For example, his earthly father, Jacob, 
uh, his plan was to groom Joseph for a leadership position in the family business. That's the reason for his coat of many colors. But his heavenly father, as we've been studying, his heavenly father's plan was to groom him for a position of spiritual leadership that would rescue two nations from devastating disaster, Egypt and Israel. Isn't that wonderful? That's why God's plan is so much greater than man's plan. It's always, tr always trumps it. This is James' point, in my opinion. This is James' point in James 4.15 when James says, instead you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I mean, at, I mean, this is the place we're moving towards in our Christian growth. That's what the, Joseph had to move that way. It's where it's God, whether it's this or that, it's always about God's will, whether it's this or that. Whether it's this or that. And, and I found that in Joseph over 13 years. He was 17 years old when God began to train him and groom him for leadership position. 13 years. In those 13 years, there was a plot to murder him. He was thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, Potiphar's wife incident. He was an innocent man, innocent man in prison before God fulfilled his will for his life to rescue two nations. I mean, and, and listen, for Joseph, it was all about learning this and that. <laughs> It's this or that. It's this or that. And it's important. What determines whether this is right or that is right? God's will. God's will. You do the right. The right is to find out what God's will. What does the Bible say? What does God say about that issue? That's how this stuff works. James put the words live, Zoe, put zeo, zeo uh, in the verbal form. That's Zoe in the verbal form. James put the word live and do in the future tense. <laughs> he put it in the future tense. Something that you must learn to do. You must learn to do. He, he contrasted the uncertainty of the best laid human plans to the certainty of the better laid plans of God. I think Paul had that in mind when he wrote Romans 4.21 when he said, being fully assured that what he has promised, what God has promised, God is able to perform, okay? Okay, listen, when you look back, is it God or us who are unfaithful? Because God is never unfaithful. Second Timothy, 2.13, even when we are faithless, he is faithful. Cannot deny do what? Cannot deny he cannot deny himself. Well, that's going to do it for me tonight. Uh, I would really like to have you read the last on your own because there are a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of good scripture in there that is pertinent to the point four, and I would encourage you to study that. Uh <clears throat> Uh, let me close in a word of prayer and we'll let the internet people we want to thank the internet people for visiting with us <clears throat> in our study on James uh, we're in uh, the life of Joseph on Tuesday the book of James on Wednesday and we're talking about the healthy church right now we're talking about the cup of the Eucharist what the blood represents when we take the Eucharist on Sunday so we thank you for visiting Father we're thankful for all those who have come by automobile and internet to study with us out of the book of James, uh, we looked at the better plan uh, for our life is the will of God. And so I pray that people would study that, uh, to bring this lesson into their life in application of what James taught in chapter 4, 13 through 17. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.